so I'm Emily McReynolds from the University of Washington Tech Policy Lab, and I come with a dual perspective of a lawyer, policy person, and a tech background. A little unusual, but I think very helpful, particularly in this context. Today, I'd like us to think through what happens to our privacy and security when we don't know who's listening because the device is always on. At the Tech Policy Lab, we bring together computer science, the information school, and the school of law. So we try and do an all-encompassing look at technology, not just a computer science definition, not just what laws and policies apply, but really a holistic look at these emerging technologies. And what's unusual about us is we build a team. So for each technology we want to investigate, we build a team of experts appropriate to that technology. So what I'm going to be talking to you about today included a computer security expert, happens to be the program chair of this year's conference, a roboticist, and then myself as sort of the law and policy with the technology perspective. And two years ago, we started looking at internet-connected toys. So this article in the Wall Street Journal happened in the fall of 2015. And for those who might not be able to read the title, it says, talking toys are getting smarter. Should be worried. And there should just be all caps yes after that. Um, and in this picture, you have Barbie, Dino, and Kayla, and I'm going to talk about each of them in their turn. But at this time, Hello Barbie was hoped by its creator to be the toy of 2015. Huge advance in technology, your kids can talk to this toy, and it will talk back. Of course, there were immediate concerns about how exactly this was happening, sending your kids voices and recordings to the cloud. Most people don't really know what that cloud thing is, right? Um, so Hello Barbie got one of my all-time favorite anti-hashtags. She came along with a campaign, hashtag hell no Barbie. But what is a smart toy? We need to know what we're talking about, right? So the original smart toys, depending on your childhood decade, one or both of these might be recognizable to you. Uh, in the 1980s, we had Teddy Ruxpin. So we had just gone to a point where processors were small enough that we could put them in toys like this or smaller devices. Teddy Ruxpin seemed smart because its mouth moved along with a story it told you. And it was really exciting to get one of these. This was the toy for a couple of years in the 1980s. And in the late 1990s, we got Furby. And Furby spoke Furbish. So when you got it, you had to speak to it for it to learn. Well, the longer you had it on, the closer it got to speaking English. It wasn't actually smart. Um, this is, a, if for those of you who might be Furby aficionados, this is actually a modern Furby. Um, back in the 1990s, they were not connected to the internet, and they were also blue-gray. Today, they are connected to the internet. So what's changed about these smart toys? It's not just their internet connection. We've also had enormous advances in the processing of data, right? We have big data and a way to analyze it in, way, in, in, in ways we hadn't imagined in the past. So we now have machine learning. Most of the people in this room are familiar with what machine learning is. But machine learning that really looks like AI, artificial intelligence. And this is an image of IBM Watson, which most of you will recognize. IBM Watson is in part famous for having beat Ken Jennings at Jeopardy. Ken Jennings being the person who won the most episodes of Jeopardy ever by a far, far margin. But IBM Watson easily took him down. I think one of my favorite quotes from that whole uh, instance is Ken Jennings said afterwards when asked about his loss, um, he said, I for one welcome our new robot overlords. I don't know about you, but I don't. <laughs> so around that same time, we were seeing commercialized AI. Uh, Siri came out, you could ask questions and get answers. It even seemed to have a personality, got a little snarky with you. Um, and so we've become accustomed to having our questions answered when we ask them of these intelligent personal assistants. And when we ask these questions, probably not the people in this room, but a lot of people don't think about how that question's being answered, what data is being collected in order to answer that question, right? So how does this tie back in? Well, this is an early version of Cognitive Dino. In 2014, this version of Cognitive Dino, who doesn't have his little eyes yet, um, 
won the award for implementation of IBM Watson. So this little toy is not just connected to the internet, it also has artificial intelligence built in. So, we already knew we needed to be concerned. <laughs> but there's more reasons for concern. Um, my friend Kayla, the third toy from that article, about a year after that article appeared, was banned in Germany as an espionage device. They said that the problem with the toy was that it collects and transmits data without any notice. Parents, or owners of the toy, were instructed to destroy it. You are no longer allowed to acquire one of these in the, in the country of Germany. Um, we were holiday shopping this year and I had to go take a picture of myself in front of a My Friend Kayla doll because you can still get them here in the United States. But it highlights my concern and the thing I think we should be thinking about. These toys are making changes to our privacy and security, to our baseline of how we think about our privacy and security. But they're not that different than these devices. So an Amazon Echo came out right around the same time as these toys did in 2015. And last year we had the addition of the Google Home. And these have intelligent personal assistants and are connected with a device that is always on, always listening, always ready for that next question you have. So what happens when someone is always listening? Last summer, I think XKCD, the fantastic comic uh, strip writer, nailed it. And if you can't read this, it says, when visiting a new house, it's good to check whether they have an always-on device transmitting your conversations somewhere. And the welcoming couple says, hello, we're, welcome to our house. And the couple walking in the door said, thanks for inviting us. Alexa, order two tons of cream corn. Alexa, confirm purchase. Now, can you imagine walking into your friend's house and doing this, right? Like, I feel like sometimes, I'm, particularly with my techie friends, I need to walk in and go, hey Siri, Alexa, okay Google, and then I have an idea of just what might be listening to me. Because it's not just that they're listening and that they're intelligent, but we're also being encouraged to treat them like our friends. We're being encouraged to see these as not just a device you use, but a fr helpful, fun, and friendly robot companion. This friend of yours can tell you what restaurants, stores, and other places are nearby. Now, we know that when we attribute human-like characteristics, when we anthropomorphize something, we are more likely to reveal information to it. We have scads of psychology studies to show this. We also have robotics research that shows this. So when in, in one of the leading human robotics interaction conferences, HRI, in 2016, a study was published. It was called Tell Me More. And what it showed was that if a robot expressed vulnerability, people were more likely to trust it and to disclose information to it. Think about that for a second. The robot acts human-like. This adorable little Jibo actually is an amazing advance in robotics because it spins on two axes. So that little head can follow the conversation around the room. It also has voice recognition and facial recognition. When I walk into my office, I can say, hey, Jibo, and it'll say, hi, Emily, right back, almost no delay. So what do we do about this? I think we need better terms. These are more than just smart toys. They're more than smart speakers. When I think of a speaker, I don't think of something that can order a dollhouse because a little girl is playing with it or can end up putting a Batman figurine in my checkout box. I think of something that plays music. So to classify these, I think we should be talking more about an AI agent, an intelligent personal assistant combined with a physical device. So for our purposes here, Alexa, Cortana, Google Assistant, Siri, combined with an always on, always in listening device such as the Amazon Echo, Google Home, Jibo, et cetera. So what do we do with this definition, right? We have to think about what happens when we're introducing these AI agents into the environment. And that's why I want to talk to you about hedgehogs. So hedgehogs are these cute, 
friendly little pets, right? Adorable little creatures. You just want to like take one home, put it in a terrarium. Um, but they are also a huge threat to the native wildlife in New Zealand. This is the government website out of New Zealand warning the public about the threat that hedgehogs pose to the environment. It even includes information on how to trap them. And so, I want us to think similarly about introducing these new AI agents into our lives because we've already seen government warnings. Last summer, there was a fantastic public service announcement from the FBI. They warned of the potential security dangers of bringing internet-connected toys into the home. Um, very, very well written, goes through some of the dangers, explains them in a way that just about anybody could understand, has really good proactive suggestions for how to think about these devices and handle the potential threat they pose. And just this month, the Federal Trade Commission um, issued their first settlement with a privacy and security case involving connected toys. The electronic toy maker VTech, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a second, has to pay a really big fine for messing up privacy and security on internet connected toys. So the thing is, we're not developing these toys or maintaining them securely. At least not for the consumers who are gonna be using them. Because this is the original article from the VTech hack. Thankfully in this situation, um, the toy maker, their database was discovered by a white hat hacker who proved it to this pretty well-known um, tech journalist. And it turned out later on it wasn't hundreds of thousands, it was millions. And thankfully, they didn't want to release that information to the public. But who knows what could have happened? Because it's completely understandable that people are buying these devices. A VTech tablet costs around $100. I don't know about you, but I'm not handing a two-year-old an $800 iPad. I'll hand them a tablet that's made by a toy company. So, another toy. Cloud Pets made the news last year because they left a database of all of the recordings that were in their system exposed to the public. You or I could have, well, we have the skills to have gone and seen what was in that database. And as a result, the security researchers must have just smiled with glee, picked up a Cloud Pets toy and tried to figure out how fast they could hack it. So this one, there's a great image from about a month later of about mm, 500 of these sitting on a dollar store shelf because who's going to buy them now? And we also have to talk about incentives because even if you're trying for the best security, even if you have entire teams working on this, um, Somebody wants to be the first person to hack this really well-known device and turn it into the wiretap everybody thinks it could be through a hardware hack. So these are my questions. These are our research questions. And research is in parentheses because I don't think these are questions that just academics or user study people should be thinking about. I think we should all be asking these questions. Will the introduction of always listening devices impact our willingness to share sensitive information? How is trust gonna change around these things? And for our behavior, will they impact the conversations we're willing to have around them? I look for these devices. I'm a little bit worried about accidentally triggering one. Maybe not everyone is as paranoid as me, but I think it's something to think about. And will their presence, if they're cute and cuddly and our friends, make us feel like we're never alone? What does that mean for how we form our thoughts and have our conversations? Something we should all be thinking about. Because we know people don't understand these devices. This is an article from 2016. It's about a murder case that happened where the guy whose house the murder took place in, he was an early adopter. We're talking two and a half years ago. This guy had his Amazon Echo connected to his home security system, connected to his home speakers, connected to his thermostat. Like This guy had the place wired. Um, and so after the murder occurred, the police wanted to get access to all of the devices uh, and what was on them. But of course, this device, and most devices like it, store most of their information in the cloud. So they issued a warrant 
to get the data from Amazon, and Amazon fought that warrant. For any law and policy geeks out there, fantastic brief. Amazon went to a lot of trouble, wrote this amazing brief about the implications for our willingness to speak in our homes if these devices aren't held to a higher standard before we hand this information over. It's not just the average individual. Tech journalists get it wrong too. This is from a very well-known tech site. You can see it has over 450,000 impressions, and it claims that a smart device broke up a domestic dispute by calling the police. Within hours, we knew that wasn't the case, because of course, if you work on these devices or if you've played with one of these devices, you have to give it its wake word, its command word, for it to do anything. So it's not gonna listen to a fight, overhear you, and decide it needs to call the police. And, I don't want to be so negative, there are really positive things about these devices. Um, this is an article from the AARP, the American Association of Retired Persons, and they are talking about how great this new Amazon show is because you can drop in on your elderly parent and see what they're doing. Really wonderful technology if your higher concern is the safety of that person and not their privacy. So there are positive reasons for this. And even those who try to get it right, or who are, appear to try and get it right, are getting blowback. So this is Aristotle. It was supposed to be an AI assistant connected to a baby camera. If you've had kids, you've probably had a baby camera at one point or another. We know how insecure those are. But this device, would have been directed at children. And that's really important for privacy law. So they were gonna be subject to some of the strictest privacy laws there are because we think about our children's privacy and we want to protect it. But people think about children's privacy and they want to protect it and so this device was canceled. It's not that different from the other devices I've been showing you through this whole talk. It really isn't, connect a camera put in an Amazon show, add your home monitoring system. You have the same thing without the same level of protection because it's not directed at children. So, I want us to think carefully about what we're bringing into our lives. They might look cute and friendly and fun. They might look like this polywog. If you like Stranger Things, this little adorable thing the children adopted would be familiar to you. They look like Jibo, our friendly robot companion. Or Curie, who's gonna be our home assistant and allow us to check on things in our house. Or Buddy, who just wants you to adopt him. Uh, and I actually like this phrase for thinking about it. Think about this as an adoption. If you were getting a cat or a dog, you'd probably think about what that thing needed, what it required, what it might change about your life. And so I think we should be doing the same thing for these AI agents, because otherwise, we're gonna end up with the results of the polywog. The polywog turned into this lovely cat-eating monster. Um, and I think we should be talking about these things. So when you leave here, I hope you'll be asking yourself and helping other people think through what happens to our privacy and security when the device is always listening. Thank you. <laughs>